Well, now it is time for us to start our program this morning. The Drexel Libraries has a fantastic program for you to explore the history, influence, and legacy of the Drexel family. Our Drexel University Archive staff will take you inside the new Drexel Family Digital Archive, where they will highlight fa favorite photos, portraits, costumes, and letters from the exhibit. We hope you enjoy learning more about the Drexel Libraries and how it supports student academic success. Thank you again for joining us. Please welcome Dr. Nitatsky, the Dean of Libraries at Drexel University. Thanks so much, Casey, for that introduction and good morning, everyone. As mentioned, I'm Danuta Nitatsky, Dean of Libraries, and I want to personally thank you for joining us on this 24 Hours of Impact and for taking our guided virtual tour of one of the library's newest initiatives, the Drexel Family Digital Archive. The Drexel Family Digital Archive bridges past traditions with future innovative possibilities. It connects the library's traditions both of acquiring and curating collections of holistic artifacts, historic artifacts, excuse me, and authoritative information, and of guiding personal discovery for education or research. As we take you through the virtual tour today, please note that this is a work in progress. For over a year, staff have made steady and remarkable progress to bring this initiative to light. Despite the pandemic triggered shutdowns of access to the physical library facilities and our archival collections all across campus. And we are excited to share the results with you today. So it is also a prototype for a new form of an archival collection consisting of organized digital images of historic artifacts that reside in dispersed physical locations. In this way, we virtually bring together objects from other campus archives, such as the Drexel Collection in the main building and the Robert and Penny Fox Historic Costume Collection located in the Westfall College's University City location. We imagine further ways to integrate the technology with other applications and tap our collections to extend the power of a digital archive. Through utilization and development of system features, we have created inviting experiences for you and others to independently engage with these materials as an exhibit or as an exploration you will design yourself. The digital archives enable students, faculty, and other visitors to address course assignments, research inquiries, or just personal curiosities not yet even imagined. Donations from Drexel family members made it possible to launch the Drexel Family Digital Archive. We welcome today's opportunity to illustrate the benefits such support provides the libraries to continue to improve your access from wherever you connect to the internet to not just reading materials, but to all sorts of artifacts in a variety of formats. We will continue our work to make this a truly robust digital and integrated archive that will constantly evolve and bring people and information together to keep alive Drexel history and encourage many yet unmanageable future deep dives into it. So today, as mentioned, I'm joined by my colleagues, Matthew Lyons, the university archivist, and Molly Reynolds, a project archivist. In the next few minutes, Matthew will give you a short update on the Drexel Family Digital Archive project, and Molly will follow with a tour of the archive, highlighting some examples of how you can explore it for self-directed learning. Please hold your questions, as we mentioned, to the end when we will invite you to type them in chat We'll have plenty of time to address them and have discussion at the end. So now I turn over the Zoom controls to Matthew and Molly to introduce the Drexel Family Digital Archives. Thank you, Danuta, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Matthew Lyons, Drexel University Archivist and manager of the Drexel Family Digital Archive project. This project was launched in 2019 to create an online archive celebrating the legacy of Drexel University's founder and his family. The project has also helped Drexel University libraries to strengthen our overall setup for sharing historical materials online. And particularly as Danuta said, to bring together different kinds of historical materials from different physical locations. The centerpiece of the project is the online exhibit that Molly Reynolds and others have created. She's going to walk you through that in a minute, but before she does, I want to quickly highlight a few of the project's other accomplishments. We have digitized hundreds of photographs from the Drexel family and related families and made them available online. These include six photo albums, some of which document the homes and furnishings of Drexel family members, 
Three of the albums consist of travel photographs from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East in the early 1900s, which were taken by Livingston Biddle during voyages of his uncle, George Drexel's yacht, the Alcido. We sponsored <clears throat> creation of a 21 minute video about Anthony J. Drexel Biddle Jr who had a dramatic career as a diplomat and military officer from the 1930s to the 1960s. The video is a virtual tour of an exhibition about Anthony Biddle that was on display at Drexel's main building in 2019 and 2020, which was curated by our project partner, Lynn Klauser Waddell, director of the Drexel Collection. We helped preserve the physical collection of Drexel family materials by transferring hundreds of brittle scrapbook pages to larger folders, so they are better protected against accidental damage. We created an online Drexel family research guide, which includes a genealogical register and information about Drexel family related archival collections, both at Drexel University and at other institutions. And we presented a webinar for Drexel faculty with ideas on how they can use Drexel family related materials in their teaching. The webinar was recorded and is available on the Drexel University Library's YouTube channel. So again, these are just a few highlights. And now I'm going to turn it over to Molly to show you the online exhibit. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Matthew, and thank you all very much for coming to this event today on the Day of Giving. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I'm Molly Reynolds from the Drexel University Archives, and today I'm going to share a little Drexel family history with you give you a tour of the new online exhibit platform and tell you about more recently discovered Drexel family related material in the archives. The link for this site um, is drexelexhibits.omeka.net and you can also find the link on the Drexel University Archives website. Again, if you have questions during the presentation, um, please just send them in the chat and we'll have plenty of time for discussion afterward. And of course, you can always get in touch with University Archives staff with research questions or anything else um, via this email on the screen, archives at drexel.edu. So before we get into the website demo, I just wanna briefly cover some background and also answer the question of what is an archives anyway? And archives is where materials of historic value are organized and made accessible to researchers. This material can be created by organizations, families, or individuals. Just one small part of the university archives mission is to collect and preserve records created by and about members of the Drexel family, which includes letters, photos, scrapbooks, objects, wills and inventories, and much more. No one institution holds all the records of the Drexel family. While here at the university, we have an assortment of collections about the Drexels, um, it's by no means a comprehensive documentation of the family's history. If you're unfamiliar with the university's um, history, this school was founded as the Drexel Institute of Art, Science and Industry in 1891. Founder Anthony J. Drexel was the head of the Philadelphia-based banking firm Drexel & Co, founded by his father Francis, an Austrian immigrant to the United States. Anthony Drexel was interested in establishing his legacy in a progressive school that would provide practical and well-rounded vocational education for men and women in Philadelphia. AJ himself was a reticent figure and wary of public attention, but his influence on the national economy and politics of the 19th century truly cannot be understated. He was a financial counselor to President Ulysses S. Grant, the mentor and partner of J.P. Morgan, and was involved in many philanthropic and investing enterprises, most often with his lifelong friend, George W. Childs. Um, the, two, the two are seen in this pretty charming photo portrait here. Um, Anthony is the one who's seated and he's holding in his lap a copy of the Public Ledger, a popular daily newspaper in Philadelphia that Drexel and Childs co-owned. Anthony had seven children with his wife, Ellen Rose, so that between those children and the children of Anthony's brothers, Francis and Joseph, the Drexel family tree grew very large over the next several generations. The Drexels became prominent in the American upper class and their records reflect that status. 
Their marriages, divorces, scandals, and travels were documented in newspapers. A memoir about um, one very unique family member uh, was made into a Disney musical in the 1960s. Among the family members is an ambassador to Europe during World War II, one of two American Catholic saints from Philadelphia, an arts administrator involved in the founding of the National Endowment for the Arts, and the president of the American AIDS Society in Paris after World War II, who also played a role in the French resistance. Marriages brought family ties with the Biddles, Dukes, Van Rensselaers, and the British aristocracy. The administration of the Drexel Institute was a family affair. Family members served on the board of trustees and advisory groups, funded various buildings and programs, and donated artwork. More recently, descendants of A.J. Drexel have served as administrators and faculty and raised funds for scholarships. This project brings together material from the university archives, the Drexel Collection, and the Fox Historic Costume Collection in order to give greater context and meaning to the material without having to gather it all physically in one place, but instead um, digitally on the site, making the material much more accessible. And so now at this point, um, we'll jump over to the Drexel Family Digital Archive and orient ourselves to the site. Okay, so while the website is now public, it's by no means static. New material and written content is added periodically as we continue the work of digitizing and researching the records that we have and keep exploring the history and legacy of this family. And so here on the homepage, you'll see a carousel of images of the items uh, most recently added. So anytime you come to the site, you can see what's new right away. As far as navigating the site, you can walk yourself through the exhibit, so to speak, by following the directional arrows here at the bottom of the page um, that take you through this menu on the right-hand side. And whenever you're in the site, you can see where you are by finding the text that's bold in this menu. The exhibit site is arranged thematically for those visitors who are browsing, but as you'll see, the web pages and items on the site are interconnected, allowing you to jump between sections and choose your own path based on what interests you. You can also browse and do an advanced search on all of the collection items on the site under this tab, Browse Exhibit Items. But say you've come to the site for the first time and decide just to follow along the exhibit, and you would come to this first section, Business, Fortune, and Philanthropy, that tells the story of how Drexel and Company was built and flourished and how the Drexel family rose to prominence in the mid 19th century. You notice this painting by Francis Martin Drexel from the Drexel Collection. And in reading this page, decide to learn more about the life of this family patriarch, the adventurous painter turned banker who founded Drexel and Co. By clicking on this link, you come to another page in the exhibit where we've brought together this other um, self, early self-portrait from the Drexel collection, along with two of Francis Drexel's own accounts of his travels in Europe and South America from the university archives. You can click on an item to see a featured excerpt, or if you would click on this link, you would be brought to an item page where you can read the journal and scroll through in its entirety. And you can also um, zoom in here and download if you wish. And as we scroll through the page, we see a later inscription in this journal by Estera Van Rensselaer, a note written by her in Christmas of 1916 in an effort to preserve the record of her grandfather. Now, if you're an alum, you may be familiar with Sarah Van Rensselaer without knowing it if, you've, if you lived in or have visited Van Rensselaer Hall. A.J. and Ellen Drexel's eldest child, Sarah, was closely involved with university administration. Her contributions made possible the construction of Curtis Hall, and she worked closely with the school's Department of Physical Training to encourage classes for women and children in Philadelphia. In memory of her contributions, the Institute constructed the Sarah Van Rensselaer Dormitory for Women in 1935. And if we were to search for Sarah on the site, um, sorry about that, um, <clears throat> any items or exhibit pages that mention her will appear here. 
in the results. And by clicking on an image, you're taken to an item page that tells you more about the object and also allows you to see the enlarged image here. And so continuing on to the next section of the site, here in the family gallery, you can get to know more of the Drexels. Many family members seen here have captions that link out to other items or pages where you can learn more about them. Um, for instance, under Anthony J. Drexel Biddle Jr., like Matthew mentioned, um, there is a link out to the wonderful Drexel collection video about citizen soldier diplomat, the recent exhibition about Biddle's life and career that was on campus last year. Biddle was the US ambassador to Poland when Germany was invaded in 1939 and was involved in planning the Allied invasion of France of 1944. And that is really just the tip of the iceberg. He led a very exciting life. We won't be watching the video over Zoom right now, but this link would take you out to YouTube where you can watch the video um, that contains personal artifacts, photos, memos, letters, and all kinds of material about Biddle. But coming back to our friend, Sarah Van Rensler, by following this caption, explore her Camp Hill home, you're brought to another section of the website. And again, you can see where you are by finding the bold text in the menu. Um, and here you can actually explore a house and ground Sarah shared with her first husband and their children in Fort Washington, Northwest of Philadelphia. There are options about how to engage with material. Here you can follow a link out to our digital repository, which would show you the photo album in, in its entirety. Um, or you can scroll below where we have an image of the library annotated um, with an item now in the Drexel collection. So here you can see this founder's table that belonged to AJ Drexel. Um, here it is in Sarah's home. And again, in the modern day in the Drexel collection. And so through this site, we're able to not only bring together collection material from across campus, but join together many of the digital resources the library has to offer. And so one aspect of this project that we've undertaken more recently is discovering and describing some of the relatively unknown individuals who are employed by the Drexels, especially when discussing the homes that the Drexels occupied it's easy to only imagine the Drexels living there, when in actuality, a whole team of people lived in these homes in order to serve the family. Although we have no record of any Drexel family members owning enslaved people during the 19th century, obviously their business ventures and the economy they worked within to grow their wealth was largely built on the labor of enslaved and indentured people. In documenting the family's philanthropy and Drexel and Company business practices, it is clear that this was a relatively progressive family for the times that they lived in. Um, but it's clear, but it's always important to recognize, and this project really lets us explore the social and historical context of this family, rather than only highlighting the more extraordinary aspects of their history. So here on the page discussing the Drexel colony of homes gathered around AJ and Ellen's 39th and Walnut Mansion is a summary of information here <clears throat> about the people who lived with, um, with the family at a specific point in time created using census records from 1870. And so we were able to identify um, nine different people who lived with the Drexels at this time. And as far as records we have in the university archives about people employed by the Drexels, we can look at Woodcrest Estate. Here we go. Woodcrest Mansion in Radnor was created for James W. Paul Jr., the husband of AJ's daughter, Frances. Here's James. Um, and the home was inherited by their daughter, Mary. Here's a portrait of Mary. We've found two condolence letters from Mary and from a Mary McFadden, the maid of another Drexel family member to a Mrs. William Quirk at Woodcrest. In reading the letter, it, it became clear that William Quirk lived and worked at Woodcrest for at least two decades from the time Mary was a girl to the time of her writing in 1921. And um, Quirk is actually identified as the driver of the cab in this photo, which is kind of a really cool thing to know and to have identified in the archives. 
um, but we're not sure what his exact role was at the estate. What this does tell us is that clearly there were some close relationships between Drexel families and the people employed by them. And these are relationships worth exploring because it allows us to recognize and share the records of people who are not often described or discussed in archival collections, as well as just learning more about the Drexels themselves and the world they lived in. Um, so now we'll transition to a show and tell of more recently discovered material that's now available on the site. So while searching through one of our collections, um, one of my colleagues in the archive, Simon, stumbled upon two previously unknown letters H.G. E. Drexel wrote to his son, John, in 1890. We were all really excited to read these letters because at that point, we only knew of three letters written by A.J. that were in the archives, none of which were addressed to a family member. In one letter, AJ is writing from his office in Philadelphia, and in this one seen here, he's writing from Carlsbad or Karlovy Vary in what is now the Czech Republic, where he traveled annually for vacation. And in both letters, Drexel writes with affection to his son about their shared love of music. In this letter, he even jokes that they're playing the same music in the Carlsbad theaters that they played four years ago when John was with him. And he also writes about his wife, Ellen, who was ailing at the time. As I said before, A.J. Drexel was a very private person who didn't like the spotlight. So most of what we can tell about his character comes from his actions rather than a written record. So that it's unique to have these letters where he's writing in a much more familiar way. Two other letters in the university archives, seen here. Um, and available on the site are, they're particularly significant because they were written the day before and the day of A.J. Drexel's death. Those letters addressed to Walter Burns, a partner at Drexel Morgan & Co, describe his health and current business concerns. And so because of this project, we can make all of these letters and transcriptions available for interested readers, as well as giving them greater context and letting you explore and learn more about our university founder and his family. So to wrap up here on the further resources page, um, someone researching the family can find all of the library and campus resources available online, as well as genealogy resources like family trees and a register. While this site helps us pull collections together from across campus and tell the story of the Drexel family, the library's digital repository has not only family related material, but yearbooks, full photo albums, course catalogs and other university history material you might be interested in. And I'll share that um, link in the chat after the presentation. While the Drexel Family Digital Archive is the only exhibit currently on this site, we're excited to share that a master's student in the CCI is working on creating an exhibit of oral histories conducted by Drexel students that focus on experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic that will also be hosted on this site. So not only will more content be added to the Drexel family material, but there will be a whole other exhibit to explore later this summer. Um, so I encourage you to check out the site on your own. There's a whole lot more here to be discovered than what I've talked about today and be on the lookout for new material. Um, so now I'll be joined by my colleagues, Matthew Lyons and Sarah Newhouse, and we can answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I'll ask a question first. This was very interesting. Thank you so much, Molly, for all that information. What has been the most interesting um, story that you've come across when going through the archives and putting everything together that really stuck out to you that sticks with you? That's a great question. Um, hmm. I think for me, it's just really exciting to be able to tell stories like that of the Drexel family that are so, um, that are just so, you know, present in Philadelphia even today. And, you know, I live in West Philly. And so just being able to kind of recognize, you know, different sites or buildings where I know that 
this family that I've spent so much time researching um, have lived and um, kind of existed in the past is just really exciting. I'll keep thinking of a specific story though. <laughs> if I may interject here, last night uh, at, a, at a little segment of a presentation for the trustees, Matthew brought up a very interesting discovery that I think is another angle. And that was, um, and you might like to repeat that or share that again. Um, certainly uh, the um, Catherine Drexel and her work and, and supporting uh, various people in terms of their education. And it was through, a, again, a nice little find of a letter that uh, triggered some interest there. So that might be a good example of, you know, if you had a question, how to go in and, and find some more about it. Sure, I can, I can uh, speak to that. Uh, it's a good, good, good point to note that this was um, another uh, discovery made by our colleague Simon Ragavan actually a couple of years ago um, in the papers of um, the Drexel's first president, uh, James McAllister. It was a little note that he wrote to Catherine Drexel. And so this was um, uh, AJ Drexel's niece who, um, became a Roman Catholic uh, nun, founded a, an order called the uh, Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament that did a lot of uh, educational work, uh, and uh, uh, particularly in um, Native American and African American communities. Uh, and the note uh, referred to um, the financial support that Catherine was providing for a student named, um, uh, I'm blanking on his name. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, Molly, help me. Albert Nash. Albert Nash, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> stage fright. Uh, Albert Nash, who um, uh, it, it, it turns out with some, some further investigation was a, a member of the Winnebago Nation and was one of a number of uh, Native American students who attended uh, what was in the Drexel Institute during its early years after uh, attending the Carlisle uh, Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And um, between materials that we have in the university archives and materials from the Carlisle School that they have at, D at Dickinson College, uh, we were able to piece together some, some information about uh, Albert Nash, who also uh, uh, went by the name Black Hawk. And uh, so we learned that he completed a degree in um, uh, commerce and finance from, from Drexel in 1901. And then uh, after that, he settled in Philadelphia and worked as a, as a salesman and married and uh, was also an athlete. He was a long distance runner. And so it was just a, a, a wonderful little uh, window on, uh, you know, uh, one member of the early Drexel community who uh, as, as a Native American student was, you know, part of a group that, that often doesn't, you know, get included in, in, in uh, uh, historical discussions. And, and so again, this was, this was somebody whose tuition and, and fees were paid by um, uh, uh, Catherine Drexel uh, during that time. So. Do we have any other questions? I'd just like to insert too some some really exciting possibilities of where we can go next. And as of course we can just be adding more, but one of the um, outcomes of sh sharing this uh, a few months ago with the Drexel family and the Drexel family committee um, was uh, it triggered other members of the family who for example, live in North Carolina and are part of the Dukes. And they said, oh, we know there's collections at Duke. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of relationship between the Duke family and the Drexel family. And they were all set and ready to say, well, we'll get some of that stuff back to bring it here. And the, and the excitement of this is we don't need to take the original materials in the digital archives. The excitement of this is that if we're in sort of our next phase, we're trying to also see where else beyond the campus, beyond our collections that we already have here in Drexel, 
we might find materials to link to and to again, build out even more uh, robust uh, resources for people wanting to either research uh, the family and the history of the university or other things that relate to that period. So it's this, it's this fabulous kind of a web that uh, it's not just about a static thing of what we can have here, but it's really the excitement that digitized uh, um, our, our digital archives and relating things in the surrogate, the image, uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, jeopardize the original, but yet as a learning device, as a research device, uh, is terrific to bring things together, which otherwise you wouldn't be able to travel easily and put them in front of you. Um, and, and in other archives, the other thing that that does, it triggers more interest even to come and see what else is there. So sort of a, it's a very nice kind of a relationship between cyberspace and, and physical space that is one of, the, one of the excitements of looking at and developing a digital archive. Yeah, definitely. And um, I was excited. There was actually an undergraduate student in history who um, did their uh, kind of final senior thesis on Francis Martin Drexel. And so in the site, we're able to link out to their kind of original research on this figure who's so close to the university history. So yeah, like Danuta said, it's it's a exciting opportunity to bring together all these different resources on one site. So again, to emphasize, and there's a lot we can continue with this particular focus, but this is part of an infrastructure, just this is the prototype, and we're excited to try to look at how we can create platforms that will make it even easier for other subjects, for other areas of, of collections or uh, 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 collected evidence of history, evidence of artifacts, um, uh, all sorts of things that can really expand the stretch and the accessibility uh, to materials that will be really critical for education in a lot of different fields, as well as research in a lot of different fields and a lot of different questions that come up. So that's, to me, that's really excitement of looking at this new kind of um, uh, development in the world of creating archives. And having it here at Drexel is really, um, it, it's, a, it's an important piece of what we should do well. <laughs> Thank you both for really giving a nice intro to this. It's terrific. No, oh, thank you so much. If no one has any more questions, more. Okay, and just a reminder, Eleanor put in the chat um, to send Kaylin Edelman your email so that you can receive a code for impact today. Um, thank you so much to Nuda Molly and Matthew, and thank you to our guests for taking the time today to learn more about the Drexel University Archives and the other programs that we have here at Drexel that elevate student success. Please check your email for a code to possibly increase your impact and make sure you check out our ongoing progress at drexel.edu forward slash two four. You can also check us out on our Drexel alumni social media platforms. I usually go to the Instagram and Twitter sites. So I'm actually gonna put those right in the chat so that you guys can click on them and see how we're doing today. And um, we just wanted to say thank you again for attending. We appreciate your support and we hope to see you at more of the events today. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you.